and welcome back to Literally Literary. If this is your first time joining us, be sure to check out our previous episodes. This episode, we are continuing our discussion on Alessandra Narvaez Valera's debut novel, 30 Talks Weird Love. In this episode, we are interviewing Alessandra herself. What's up, everyone? Hello. <laughs> Welcome back to the Literally Literary Podcast. Say that 10 times fast. Uh, no. So, great, great intro, <laughs> Vanessa. Uh, today is a special episode. Uh, we have a guest in the house. And uh, for our listeners, this is part three, right? So, we've already been talking about your book. But just so we can get a little bit, can you introduce yourself and let us know a little bit more? Just about your background, and and, uh, then we'll start the interview. Sure, and again, thank you for having me. Um, I'm so glad that I have the sign here. I'm (laughs) so happy to be here at Literally Literary. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, Well, my name is Alessandra Narvaez Varela, and I'm a poet and teacher. I was born in Ciudad Juarez, um, and I currently teach career writing at UT El Paso. That's a a (laughs) soundbite. Absolutely. Thank you. No, uh, I mean, we're happy that you could be here and to celebrate. We have sweet bread, you know, from Gussie's. Thanks to yes. Reina. And Thank you. Y los marranitos. Los right. marranitos. <laughs> no podían faltar. We uh, had to, you know. I, I personally was reading that. Oh, we started craving mm-hmm. marranito and <laughs> café de olla. <laughs> oh, man, that just sounds like a good snack. <laughs> Is that personally one of your favorite snacks, combos? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and I have to shout out to... Um, Panaderia Pradera Dorada in Juarez, and that's where my favorite marranitos are made. Um, mm. And Café de Olla from pretty much anywhere, but especially Tomochi in Ciudad Juarez. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I didn't say is that this is my debut book. I, I just gave a terrible introduction. To no, me. no, no. We'll get to all of that um, anyway. <laughs> I'm not great at this. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. Um, and thank you for the shout outs. From, and we'll definitely talk about Juarez and the role that it plays in your book. So, um, like you said, this is your debut book. Um, we're so excited that you're here so that we can talk about it and ask you personal questions about 30, um, Talks Weird Love, and the process and themes and all the good stuff. Um, I know that, um, well, diving into the questions, um, I think we mentioned this in part one a little bit. Uh, Richie had mentioned that that this is evidently a love letter to our younger selves. Um, It it can be seen as a hopeful book, despite some of the darker, heavier topics that you do discuss throughout. Um, But I would argue that it's also a love letter to the border. Um, So kind of going off of, you know, you're already shouting out Panaderias and Juarez. Um, Can you tell us a little bit more about your relationship to the border, maybe how it shaped the book? and the meaning that it holds for you currently uh, in writing or even outside of that? Yeah, sure. Uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful question because it's something that's been in my mind, especially since I started writing at the MFA at UTEP, because before I was not as aware of the effect the border had in my writing and my identity. Um, the first thing I would say is that, and I know if you agree that that whole phenomenon of double consciousness is definitely part of living Mm. here and also Mm. as a writer. Mm -hmm. Um, So it took me too long. Uh, Luckily, I I got to the point where I would use two languages, which is another uh, characteristic of living in the border. We're we're bilingual, Mm -hmm. bicultural, uh, some of us. So that's one thing that I'm really proud about in this book that I was able to welcome and embrace my bilingualism and not give in to labels like being a pocha, for example, Mm -hmm. which is um, to me a derogatory term to describe our hermanos, our paisanos who are of Mexican descent but may not um, be able to communicate in Spanish. And we have to, and I don't mean to go into many tangents, but we have to examine why our hermanos don't speak Spanish, Mm -hmm. for example. And it has to do with the history um, Mm -hmm. in Texas and in other states where their ancestors were not allowed to 
speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. Anyways, sorry about the, the tidbit <laughs> information, but it took me too long to learn things like this and for me to embrace um, this beautiful hybrid of a language, um, which is um, English and Spanish. I don't know if you would call this Spanglish. What do you think? Like the book, is it in Spanglish or is it more like the spine? Is it? No, right? No, but it is navigating both. It right? is navigating. Yeah. And I'm asking you this. Fluently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm asking this because Spanglish, um, it has rules, mm -hmm. right? Just like African. Mm -hmm. enough, yeah. yeah, it has rules. And just like African-American vernacular English or black English has yeah. rules. Um but there's, we still have to do more work, I believe, in for writers who use Spanish to say this is a beautiful, legitimate um, hybrid language. Again, I went off on a tangent, but the passion that I feel for this relates to having this on the page for me, just mm -hmm. having the majority of it being in English, but still feeling proud enough to bring Spanish into this took me very long, too long. So that's one of the main things that I get from my experience being in the border. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing is Ciudad Juarez, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I was born and raised there, as I said, and I moved to El Paso back in 2007. It was a really <laughs> weird transition mm -hmm. um, because just they are sister cities, but they are very different. Um, mm -hmm. I thought El Paso was too quiet. <laughs> <In the beginning. laughs> I, I lived in a very, hmm. by a very crowded street. And I remember yeah. backing out our cars was like a, a whole production. <laughs> We're like, go, 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 go. <laughs> and here, even the crickets were silent. Oh, I, love that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what, what your experience is. And I don't know if you actually, were, were all of you born here in El Paso? Have you always lived in El Paso? I wasn't born here, but I've always lived here. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Where were you born? I was born in Denver. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't even know that. So. Yeah. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah. Just found out new things. I know. <laughs> um, I, I was born here, and I've, I've lived here, you know, my whole life. So um, that's, why this, I didn't, that's why I know this book works so well, too, here. Um, mm -hmm. When you were born, also. I was born of, in Los Angeles, but I, baby. yeah. Yeah, I, we moved here when I was seven, so I, I grew up in El Paso. Oh. Yeah. And, and, and I love that the diversity of experiences. Mm. Um, but see, growing up in Ciudad Juarez, moving here when I was about to graduate, it was a, a weird transition. I remember going back to my house in Juarez and crying because I missed it so much. Um, mm. A big thing, though... Um, is that in writing about Ciudad Juarez in 1999 and addressing the first wave of femicides, mm. that was also really complex and difficult for me to do because I did not want to stigmatize the city any further mm. or minimize it to just a place of horror and yeah. murder, yeah. which has been done before to the city. And the other thing is that um, I might not be living in Ciudad Juarez right now, but this is still home to many people, and they see it as more than what has been represented in the media. So yeah. it was a difficult process trying to, I guess, balance the anxiety the protagonist feels with this other feeling of, I love my city, which is mm -hmm. what I find out a lot of people in my generation, and even now, they, they resonate with that. It's like we go through stages where like, I'm in love with my city. I love Ciudad Juarez, and it's like, why? Why does it have to be dangerous? Yeah. You talk mm. a lot about that frustration in the book, and I think you do it well enough. Um, one of the questions that we did have was related to that regarding um, choosing to cover difficult subject matter and, and the frustrations of it, but also through the lens of uh, a YA novel. Like how how you know how what, what was that like? How did you decide to you know walk that process and maybe. You had some in insight also from your publishers. I'm not really. What do you, what, how was that experience for you? Well, when writing this, when I started writing this back in January 2019, I was not aware of. I was not as aware of who the audience was. I know I knew this was for young adult, but readers, but not necessarily what that meant. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Little by little, though, talking with other authors in the past one and a half years in panels or conferences, is that young adult literature is so appropriate for tackling these issues. Um, if we think about teenagers, um, and I was a high school mm-hmm. tutor in Anthony, Texas, for five years, they're they're ready for this kind of conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is that you have to invite them to it. Um, another thing that I really admire about teenagers is that they don't put up with any BS. They'll read you very fast, and they'll know if you're being real or not. Mm. So throughout the revision process, I was like, if this is my main audience, I have to come forward and say even more than I was willing to say before the first draft. I have to keep yes. on digging. Mm. Um, and as far as my publishers, especially in Cinco Puntos, my editor, Lee, was pivotal to understanding the audience more and more and more because um, my background is in poetry. So I often forgot, like, this is supposed to tell a story, right? And who are the characters and the mm-hmm. setting, the time. At one point in the book, I had n- not even an inkling of how much time had gone uh, by. So, but yeah, that's what I would say about young adult. It's, it's, it, it's a right, it, and it's one of the best genres to tackle difficult topics. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's necessary. And we, we have talked about mm-hmm. that in the past, not just when we're talking about your book, but other YA books. And it's unfortunate because there's a climate right now of, of still people who want to get books banned because of the content matter. Mm. Yeah. Right? So we just yeah. keep fighting the good fight as educators, right, and introducing it to our students. Because, uh, you know, we're thinking, again, thinking of audience in this, this particular podcast, our audience is comprised of people, obviously people who are interested in the book, but also students and even educators. So we're always kind of thinking about these questions as well, you know, that they might be interested in learning more about. Could we bring this in the classroom? It doesn't have to be the college classroom. We can start younger. And because it is YA, you know. Um, So I I thank you for saying that, that it's crucial, you know, for for them and that they Mm -hmm. can handle these topics. Because I think that we lose sight of that and we collectively, um, which is why things like banning books is happening and, no, they can't handle it, or no, let's shield them a little longer, you know, when all this stuff is happening outside anyway. So yeah. you appreciate cool. that. Cool. You know, so speaking of, of our audience, I know that a lot of our listeners are, are, you know, aspiring writers, you know, who are maybe looking to get published for the first time. As a, as a first-time published author, God, man, that's so great. You're, you're like now <laughs> along the border, like published. What do you, how do you Thank feel you. about that for one, but two, like maybe kind of talk about your experience with like going from that, like having an idea of a book to maybe just finding publisher and, and working through to finally have it in your hands. Yeah, of course. Um, first of all, it's a wonderful feeling. Um, I remember getting the email from Lee Bird before Cinco Puntos was acquired by Lee and Low Books in New York. And I started crying. Um, there's a really bad picture of me that my spouse <laughs> took. Um, and I remember getting the email and running to him and knocking on the door because he was using the restroom. And so I I pushed him to come out sooner and I told him and I was just like, I was just in, in, in a state of frenzy and disbelief. Mm. Um, after that, of course, um, the character, which I'm, I'm sure you've talked about, she is very... Um, I guess not to put it in a nutshell, but she's a type A in, in mm. a way. Not that I'm a, I have an experience in psychology, but I'm very much like that. So after the happiness came the dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> what does this mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I did, however, allow myself to just enjoy it for maybe a week or so. I also mm-hmm. talked to my family about it. Um, but... We had, not in my family, not my spouse, we did not know what it meant. And this is probably an unoriginal image for the publishing industry, but it's a machine. Mm -hmm. There's so many cogs, there's so many turns that as aspiring writers, we just don't know about. And I would really counsel um, undergraduate and graduate uh, programs here in the border to have at least a class or a discussion 
-hmm. about this because first, the first thing is get published, but then it's a whole process. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm. The first thing being, um, after my my week of happiness was done, (laughs) I started with revision. Oh, my goodness. Um, I used to tell my students at UTEP, revision is everything. And I believed it, and I still do, but I lived it. Um, this book that you see right here, um, all in all, it might have gone through five or six revisions. Also, each poem, I think there are around 70 poems. Each one got at least revised two times. Um And of course, there were the moments of epiphany where a poem almost came out right, (laughs) but most of them needed a lot of work. So I think that's something that we have to talk about more often, which is once you create your first or even your second draft, you have to keep committed Mm -hmm. to this this practice. Um, That's a very big thing for me. And now that I continue teaching, I bring up the example and I hope that they actually take it to heart little by little because it yeah. it means everything. Uh, the product that you see here, whenever you buy any book, <laughs> it didn't start like that. And I've also used another, um, is it a metaphor, an analogy? Oh, my goodness. Um, I'm going <laughs> to fail poetry now. But um, just like they say that raising a child, to raise a child, you need a village. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You need a village to produce a book. Mm, yeah. Because with each revision, going back to it, you have, I had Lee Bird, my editor, looking at it. I had my junior editor, Stephanie Frescas Macias. Mm. And of course, the editor who was always there for me from the beginning, who is Paul Laprad, my spouse. So I love it's. Paul. Oh, he's, <laughs> oh my goodness, he's an amazing, amazing uh, man. And I also, if I allow myself this tangent, it's also a love letter for him. Uh, because he's very much present in this book. Um, yeah, yeah. His his passion and his patience made this possible. Mm-hmm. So, so many eyes go through this. So many filters. That's mm-hmm. the writing part of it. And then I remember getting the first proof of the cover. We were so excited because the illustrator Paulina Magos, uh, she's from Guadalajara, and I was beyond happy because she's a paisana and I'm I'm very proud to say that now we're in touch <laughs> and I sent her a book um, so there's that process the other process that really um, surprised me was actually putting the book together um, mm. Sik Peña who was in charge of doing that as well as Stephanie I think they they loved hated me <laughs> because opposed to regular prose, mm. every page was different. Mm. And that must have been a little bit of a nightmare, but they were amazing. They kept on going back to each poem, especially the concrete poems. Mm-hmm. We went through at least two um, versions of them to find the better shape, for example. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. it's one thing, I created the shape in Microsoft Word, but then they had to adapt it to whatever program they use Mm -hmm. and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. I also Mm -hmm. went back to him uh, since the margins changed. Um, That's writing and making those kinds of decisions. And then there's promotion. Oh, Oh, my goodness. That's that's like a whole other thing, right? Promotion plus pandemic. So you have double. That is, yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. And before we start recording, I was talking about how bad I think I am at promoting um, because a lot of the responsibility, even though the press has done a great job, it's almost understood that is the author's job to like Mm. really, Mm -hmm. really um, further those efforts. Um, Another thing that I would love for our creative writing programs to tackle and to discuss, what does it mean to put your name out there in your book and what, how do you want to do it? There's a lot of authors who have a very restrained approach. There are some other authors who go for it. And there are some people in the middle. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I would like to share for aspiring writers. Revise, revise, revise. And prepare to um, inhabit different roles. Yeah. That other writer, 
um, and that of the publicist, I guess. Um, exactly. Yeah. And if you happen to teach or you happen to have another kind of job, then you have that other role. And that split can be a, a little bit difficult in the beginning. Mm. Makes sense. Long answer, sorry. No, no, no. that's exactly <laughs> what yeah. I mean. In the past, we've, we, I mean, when we talk about our books, we always credit like the end sections, right? Where you have the acknowledgements. Mm. And it's yeah. very mm -hmm. true what you say, right? It takes a village. It's just yeah. to acknowledge everyone that is behind the process is, is such an important part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was curious about, um, like in your creating the book, which poem was the first one that kind of was what started you to write this book? Oh my goodness. That's such a good question. Let me remember, <laughs> because interestingly, I wrote this in a composition notebook and it was regular mm -hmm. prose. And once I mm -hmm. typed it, it just, it was poetry. Mm -hmm. I would say though, that the first poem it's the first one. I wasn't looking for her. Okay. It has gone through so many transformations, but mm -hmm. this is the one that reminds me the most of the initial idea. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. I wasn't looking for her. And the whole image of being in the multicinemas and getting and having, excuse me, Ana Maria meet 30 there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you already envisioned that like encounter of this, this stranger who ultimately has a connection with the... The protagonist of the, of the piece. Yes, yes, correct, correct. Mm. That's a, it's a fascinating concept, too. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, um, going back to the acknowledgments and the reason why I have so many students, it's because they're really at the heart of this book, uh, especially my high school students. Mm -hmm. um, I was or saw myself as their 30, and I would try through really corny language to say, you're beautiful, <laughs> you matter, and they would be like, I miss N, you know. Um, some of them would like it, and we would talk, and some of them would just roll their eyes, but I just kept pushing because I never, since, uh, sadly, I never had a visitor from the future visit me and tell me that I was also, you know, I was just beautiful because I was alive. That's why mm. I overdid it with my students. <laughs> um, I also saw that I had not had much of a teenagehood um, because I would see their their youth, and I mean youth in the heart, right? Mm. Their ability to laugh, their ability to even be overly dramatic. That's mm. why I really love working with teenagers. It's Everything is a flor de piel. Everything hits mm. them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I admire that so much because I never... I was never like that. I was mm -hmm. always studying, always thinking about the next deadline or the next achievement. <coughs> and if it hadn't been for them in Anthony High School, shout out as well <laughs> to the Wildcats, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have had the idea either. Mm -hmm. So I owe it to them and to all of my students. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that kind of touches on a question that uh, Jorge Gomez had. And shout out to Jorge too. You know, he, Hola, Jorge. Yeah, he was <laughs> yes. asking about why he chose to come from the point of view of a 13-year-old rather than a, you know, 25, 26-year-old, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, about? exactly. Mm -hmm. I guess it goes back to me wanting to live vicariously through a 13-year-old. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, um, Reina, this is a love letter as well to my younger self. So I wanted um, Ana Maria, but also me, again, by proxy to have that opportunity to embody that age again and enjoy it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why I chose this point of view. Um, and, and something that really changed, I think, throughout the revision process is that the voice of 30 is present, but not as, it's not overwhelming, I think, at least in my opinion, because I really wanted um, for the 13-year-old protagonist to shine and also to bring up um, that we have so much to learn from our younger peers, not only from mm. the wise yoga, yoga, oh my goodness, Yoda, <laughs> Yoda figure, right? It's like, I'm old and I'll tell you what I know. Not mm. at all. Um, of course, we do have to learn from our older peers, but what about those who are children or teenagers? Mm. Um, Richie and I participated in, a, in an after-school program. Yeah. 
-hmm. teaching poetry, and we were both a little bit afraid because we hadn't <laughs> worked with such uh, young students. <laughs> um, but what really, really marveled me and amazed me that if you really take the time to just sit down and listen to how they think and what mm. how they feel, it's just a beautiful experience. And you do learn from that willingness to see the world a certain way or even mm. just because they're not I guess as influenced by this societal contamination yet <laughs> their their word um, choices their syntax mm. their syntax excuse me mm -hmm. it was so fresh and it's like oh my goodness I wanted to steal or older lines <laughs> oh, yes. did not and if I and if I do I'll ask for their permission so <laughs> Yeah, that was great working with them. They were so adorable. Oh, they were. <laughs> they were. And so wise in their own way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lots of learning for sure. So. I think that that answered the other question, or you kind of started um, answering it, if you encountered any challenges in writing from the 13-year-old perspective. Um, and if you had any difficult or fun aspects about, about writing from that perspective, um, and as a future self. Because of what I mentioned, um, coming from the background of poetry, I would struggle at times to remember that I was trying to em embody the voice of a 13-year-old. Mm. This does not mean at all that I was condescending. No, it's just you do have to access a different part of yourself. Mm -hmm. So at times I would come from the perspective of a 30-something-year-old when that is not mm. the case. Um, so it, it goes back to what I was saying. So it's spending that time with teenage students and, and students who are children that really helped me. A lot, but it was still a struggle. Luckily, I had my editor there saying, whoa, <laughs> what are you doing? Um, one thing that I would like to mention in, um, in regards to the group of students that I work with um, who were ages, I think, between 7 and 12, that it was because of them that I added the concrete poems in there. And that's something that I was discussing with you um, before we started recording. They loved that. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> during the summer of 2020, a period where we're, we were all very confused and very much isolated. I remember Lee Bird said, this girl needs to have fun. I'm not good at fun. Um, I was never good at fun. I think actually I'm a little bit better at it. But going back to 13, I was, I just did not know uh, how to have fun in the normal sense of the word. Mm. And so the answer came to me by drawing a mama leche, a hopscotch, and saying, this is how someone like Ana Maria would have fun. And I connected that to the experiences those students had in the Boys and Girls Club at Canutillo. They just loved it. And I, yeah. I, just, I just loved the idea of going back to that place where you can just draw a shape and have that be the margins that you have to restrain yourself to. Mm -hmm. And that's how I had fun. That's something that I would say. And it was a very late addition to the book. So when I submitted this to the editor, it was one of the last uh, drafts. And I was nervous. But I think that the enjoyment um, came through and, yeah. and she liked it. And I was like, oh, that's good. <laughs> that's great to know because I think that's one of the more unique things about the book is how yeah. you have, I mean, yes, it's poetry and prose. But you also include the concrete poems, but also you have these other genres too, like letters, blackout poetry, mm -hmm. uh, edit like a live poem that's edited, not live poem, but like you have back to back. Like those are very yeah. fascinating mm -hmm. things, you know, and I think that really helped the book stand out as a reader, especially yeah. um, we were talking about it from an educator's point of view. Like you get to teach these things now, you know, you bring it to the classroom and you get to talk about these different forms. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for noticing that. Um, because it is, I think it's so difficult at times to teach writing and creative mm. writing. Mm -hmm. So I do hope that um, educators can can use this and use it as a blueprint for lessons. Or and, mm. um, and just so you know, I'm always open for any kinds of questions about the book. If you were up for library visits or classroom visits, mainly through Zoom, I guess, because of 
how times are like, but I'm here to answer any questions. But thank you. Well, since you bring it up, I mean, for our listeners, how would they, I mean, what's the best way maybe someone can get a hold of you for that? Um, I think that the best way is to go to my website, which is www.lesandranarvaezvarela.com. Um, uh, and then there's a contact form there. Hmm. And that's how they can get in touch with me. And there's actually, a, I guess, a tentative, tentative list of things that I can cover. Hmm. Um, but I'm always willing to work with the teacher, the librarian, or just the writing group, a community a group. Um, hmm. For example, there's a book club going on in Laredo um, about the book, and I'm going to visit with them in March. So I'm very much excited yeah. to do those kinds Aww. of things. That's awesome. Yeah. I already know a couple of people that would probably hit you up. You hear that, Eddie? Groove? All right. <laughs> you better contact her, right? Bring her to the students. They're going to love her. <laughs> and I know you said that the little kids like the concrete poems, but that's one of the first things that I talked about first show. I was like, oh, my God, the blackout poetry, and it's so cool. Because you don't really see it that much, the Margarita and all of those poems. So mm. um, it's definitely new and, and a new and fresh way to to bring to light um, the process and, and – um, just what this young girl's going through, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for, for talking about that and explaining a little bit about how you brought that into the the final draft, which is really interesting. My pleasure. <laughs> Did you have any other questions, Vanessa? Do I? Hmm. I, I have to think of one off the top of my head. That's hard. <laughs> Two style. Ready? Every style. Three, <laughs> two. <laughs> 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 How um, or yeah, I mean, maybe while you think of one, yeah, go ahead. I'm trying to think about how to phrase this. It looks like you've been received really well by, like, I mean, so brave books, mm. literarity. You have a lot of the community already right behind you. How, how's that been? Oh, that's been beautiful. Um, especially uh, the Clarks. Um, Bill and, and Mariana Clark, they've been amazing uh, in supporting this book. And that's another thing that I would tell aspiring writers is to, even before you, you get to publish a book, support your local bookstore. Mm -hmm. um, they're such a vibrant part of our community. And so um, I, there's just no equivalent, for example, it actually doesn't even exist that Amazon would tell you, oh, you've you've sold these many copies. They don't mm -hmm. they don't really care. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the business, but there is nothing like that personal connection to Mr. Clark who mm -hmm. tells me you've sold this these many copies. This person asked about it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we had a young reader ask about this. Um, and that's really the beating heart of our community. So that's been really, really amazing. And I'm very thankful to um, literary and, as you said, brave books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're definitely a, a champion. So. Um, and um, we were talking pre-show, and you had mentioned you recorded your audio book. And so to talk about, you know, the book being available, obviously, obviously you want to shop at local bookstores, but it's also available now in audiobook. So that's exciting, too. Yeah. Did you, did you record in Voices? <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Um, I tried. And I remember discussing that with the director. It's like, I'm not good at voices. Um, she talked to me about, no, you're, we don't expect <laughs> you to do that. I'm not a voice actor. Um, but I just tried my try to differentiate them as much as I could mm -hmm. with just mm -hmm. little, um, I don't know, intonations, little... But it was, a, it was a whole process. It was really fun. And I actually felt like an actor of sorts. And <laughs> it was a process of one day and a half. And that's one of the moments in my life that I most felt like a writer because I understood the story like never before. I was just completely focused on it for mm -hmm. that day and a half. It was a really cool experience. And it is available. So um, if my <laughs> voice is not too grating, you can listen to it. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was a really cool experience. You see? Okay. So we just heard that you were nominated for the RISE project. Oh, wait, what is it? 
It's yeah, a, it's, it's a, a it's, long, a, it's a long name. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wait. It's a book list. It's yeah. A, um, yeah, no, that was really cool. The the news came to me on Thursday. Um, and that was really cool because thank you. Guys. Thank you. It's an honor to be in the company of those books. Um, <laughs> and it's a, yeah, it's a really comprehensive list of maybe 500 plus books um, wow. from early um, early readers to uh, young adult in fiction mm-hmm. and nonfiction. Um, and something that really jumped at me from the description is, and I was honored by it that said that these books were, um, uh, oh my goodness, and I'm going to ruin this, like um, an instruction manual for activism, mm. something like that. I might, I might be misquoting. Um, but yeah, that's, it was, I was really honored, really honored to, to have, to receive this, this um, I guess. Um, uh, not like a nomination or an inclusion. Uh, uh, yeah, an inclusion, an inclusion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and when I saw my book really close to another one that I was that I was currently reading, the Mirror Season, mm-hmm. by Ana Maria Macklemore, I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. Oh, I mean, um, their book, um, as and many others, I was just <laughs> so so thankful to be in such amazing company. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. sure that's a, the first of many of those that you'll be seeing. So. Yeah. <laughs> Gracias. Gracias. So get used to it. <laughs> yeah. I had a, a follow-up question um, just because you've been talking a lot about YA and, and reaching the younger audiences. Is that something you're going to want to continue doing in future um, projects is the, the YA audience? Or are you looking to venture outside of that? Well, right now, something that is in the works and something that I, a project that I had more or less I don't want to call it deserted because my character might get angry with me. <laughs> but I wasn't able to juggle that process with teaching and, and PR, speaking of publicity. Mm-hmm. But it is a project uh, for young adults. Um, the exciting thing is that it's prose. It's a regular novel. Mm-hmm. So I am I'm take, I'm, I'm going to be in an adventure. <laughs> um, and... The other cool thing for me is that the focus is in a 16-year-old boy named Amilcar. So it'll be the first time that I'll be um, trying to tell a story um, from a character who identifies as a boy. I'm also using a third-person limited narrator, which is new for me. So Hmm. that's what's going on. But I I really, um, something that I would like to tell aspiring writers to not put yourself in a box my mm. thesis in the master's program was not a YA young mm-hmm. adult novel in verse. It was just a regular collection of poetry. So you really don't know where you'll go in terms of your writing and also what you read. Read everything. Mm. I think that's um, very, very important. Um, my other um, project, um, but that's still very amorphous and very, very, very messy. It's just a collection of poems. But right now, Amilcar... He's my focus, and I'm saying his name out loud, so <laughs> he joins me and, and really allows me to tell his story yeah. the best way possible. There you mm-hmm. go. That's amazing. How exciting. Can't wait to read it. Thank you. <laughs> no, yeah. We'll just have to get it published first. But yeah, <laughs> that's the hope. That's the hope. <laughs> now it's awesome. out there. You're right. I'm, I'm just sending the, uh, the vibes to, to the universe. I'm manifesting mm-hmm. that. <laughs> awesome. Well, I don't know if we had any more um, comments. I mean, do you have any other events or anything else that you're trying to do in the, like, during this semester, maybe? Or promote? Yeah. Um, well, um, in chronological order is, <laughs> in, in a way, that, that sounded like in modest. No, I mean, <laughs> what I meant is what's coming up in, in, in February is that I'm going to be featured in the City Magazine. And that was a really cool interview. Awesome. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping that maybe we can organize a reading. And um, thank you to Erin Coolahan. I was going to ask if it was Erin. Oh, she, yeah, she was amazing, amazing interviewer. Yeah. Um, just like you guys, thank you yeah. so much. So I'm hoping we can have a reading um, about that. I'm very excited, especially for um, going to the Texas Library Association conference in April. Um, mm. If um, I, Hopefully the travel will still be possible and it'll be in mm-hmm. Dallas. I'll actually get to... Um, interact with with readers librarians who are a wonderful part of our community so important and also talking to fellow writers in the flesh Mm -hmm. that's something that very excited about Mm -hmm. um 
that's what I can think of right now. Um, yeah, that's what I can think of right now. Um, I, I am trying to envision um, an event where it could be reading poetry and also inviting a friend of mine who's a musician and even my sister who does henna. So I'm mm. envisioning a, a, a very, what, what would it call it, a multi- Multi, multi something event like a <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> multi genre. Normally, normally, I want to say like multidisciplinary, but yeah. it's a pretty eclectic, you know. Yes, yeah. yes, eclectic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but that's that's still something that's uh, that's in the works. And as I said before, my my um, one of my biggest dreams is to actually go on library and school visits here in this community. That's mm -hmm. very important to me. Um, yeah. I've already stopped some of our librarians here in the main <laughs> districts, but um, I would like to um, to um, reach out again and, and say I'm here. I'm definitely here for you. And I know these are really difficult times for our librarians and our teachers. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for your hard work. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> awesome. That's great. How exciting. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. It is something um, else that I didn't say about all of this is that it is surreal. That's, mm -hmm. <laughs> it is very surreal. So yeah. even being here with you in this room and knowing that you read it with so much love and it, it means the world to me. So thank you. Mm. Well, thank you for coming and thank you for writing this book. And yeah. we can't wait to read, you know, the next projects. And definitely we'll talk about what else you can do to come into the universities. I know you're looking at younger audiences, but I mean... That's the university magic. students, yeah, you know. Right. We, right. we also, oh with border senses, yeah. I mean, we. I'm already thinking about a lot of ways yes. to bring yeah. you in. So, you know, we'll talk after. I, I did not forget. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. The Spring Arts Festival, Yasmin Ramirez. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. She's coming up with her wonderful memoir, Andale Prieta. Mm -hmm. She invited me to be part of her event. So this is in May. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Oh, Yasmin, I'm, I'm not doing my job with PR. Yes, that's another event that I'm so, so excited yeah. about because awesome. it is with our, in this community. Yeah. So yes. very excited about that as well. And that's the magic of YA. Yes. YA is not limited to the readers that the cover says, right? Mm. Um, I think adults also gravitate towards it because mm -hmm. it tends to be very much on the surface of mm -hmm. feelings, emotions, and experiences. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we're definitely not young adults anymore. Well, maybe <laughs> Vanessa is, but <laughs> we loved it. So at heart, at heart, I guess at heart, but young yeah. at heart. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, shout out to Yasmin. We are going to, we do plan to read her book as well oh, yes. and, and talk about it. And, uh, yes. Much like the foodie she is, I believe we're looking forward to, to eating some treats right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. That is amazing. So. Yeah. Yasmin, her, I think her, her book on El Prieta is going to come out in April. Mm -hmm. Yes. Also from Lee yeah. and Lowe Books. So yes. be on the lookout because it's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. <laughs> Say bye, bye. To, the, to the audience here. First time live. <laughs> <laughs> First time recorded, actually. That's really cool. I know. All right. Awesome. Cool. Peace. We're done. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Literally Literary, brought to you by Border Census and Power at the Past. This episode, we continued our discussion on 30 Talks Weird Love by Alessandra Narvaez Valera. Join us on our next episode, where we begin dis dissecting The Ones Who Don't Say They Love You by Maurice Carlos Ruffin. If you haven't read it, we hope we inspire you to pick up a copy. Follow us on Instagram at literallyliterary.ep and on Twitter at literallyliterary.ep.